Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today, so um, I have a lot of backup, which I need, which is Deirdre and Melissa and Josh and Paul. I um, want to talk a little bit about where we are in COVID. A lot is happening, spending a lot of time talking to fellow governors, and uh, then talk of how that is impacting our economy, because the two are very closely related. A quick snapshot since yesterday. Um, you should see that we continue to do a lot of uh, PCR testing, 22,000. The positivity rate of 2.3%. I can say that's a lot better than where we were a couple days ago. I can tell you it's not a lot more than where we were a couple of months ago. Uh, take that for what it is. It's trending up uh, in a slightly controlled way, I'd like to think. Um, fatalities, too. Hospitalizations, 19. Hospitalizations are up, as you remember, um, you know, uh, infections are a leading indicator and hospitalizations lag a little bit. Uh, they are up 232, uh, some of our highest we've had in a couple of months. Remember, at our worst, we were 2,000 COVID-related hospitalizations. A couple of things have changed on hospitalizations in the last six months, which you should probably know about. Um, back then, about a third of our people that went to the hospital ended up in the ICU, uh, intensive care. Today it's not one-third, but it's 20 percent. I think that shows that we have some better therapies and we're screening people earlier, which is a real positive. Back then, probably 22 percent of the folks who ended up in the ICU, um, they were fatal. Uh, today it's um, 6 percent. So you see where, again, they're making incredible progress when it comes to um, keeping people alive and keeping people out of the ICU. The average age of fatality is still about, or median age is still about uh, 80. So the demographics have not changed quite as dramatically when it comes to hospitalizations as maybe we could have anticipated before. This is next chart is the one we said we're going to uh, release every Thursday. And it gives you an idea of um, what the spread is like in our state. And obviously, if you're in the gray, um, you have um, as, as few cases as we've had in a long time. Most of Litchfield County is looking pretty good. Um, a lot of Fairfield County was pretty good. Uh, Norwalk and uh, Fairfield are flared up. You can see uh, if you got really good glasses, they're red. This is a little bit like a mirror image from where we were in May when Fairfield County was on fire and Southeast Connecticut um, what was not hit very hard. Today you see most of the red is in um, uh, that area of southeastern Connecticut. I can tell you those areas that are in the red alert, 15 plus uh, cases per 100,000 on a daily basis. Um, we've gone from 11 to 19 towns. So you can see it is continuing to extend uh, yet again. Uh, but there is some progress. Um, New London and uh, Norwich and Danbury are continuing to trend down. So. Um, uh, when we bring in the rapid response and over a period of time, I think we are able to get this contained. Danbury, again, is that's not going to be red next week if we're doing our job and if everybody is uh, maintaining the discipline there. And that is not spreading to its neighboring town. So I take that as a very good um, news. By the same token, uh, Norwalk and Fairfield down there in uh, uh, lower Fairfield County, they are more like a hockey stick. So. Um, those are the two sides of the equation. I can just tell you on this next chart, um, this is what our recommendations are. First of all, um, in the darker blue, East Hartford, Fairfield, Groton, Lisbon, Norwalk, Plainfield, Prospect, Salem, Waterbury, and Waterford are all the add-ons to um, our red um, alert list. Uh, thankfully, East Lyme and Preston have gone off, so uh, it's not static but it is a reminder um, that it is expanding. What does the red alert mean? Let me just remind you. Um, a, we noticed you and uh, uh, Deirdre and Max were um, on with all the um, public health and mayors from those red alert towns, you know, re-emphasizing if you're 65, stay home. Here we go again. No unnecessary um, travel. Uh, we're going to work on our, um, be able to do the home delivery, the door dash, everything we can. Uh, limit your meetings with non-family members, those that you're not very close to. I know we've got the holiday season coming up, but uh, especially in these red alert areas where there's real community spread, um, special time to be very careful. 
Again, um, we have to pay extra attention to our nursing homes, and that's why we are um, ramping up our testing of um, staff at all of our nursing homes around the state making a special priority for residents and visitors uh, in our uh, red alert areas. I'm a little surprised, by the way, that CMS, coming out of the federal government, is, uh, continues to mandate visitations at nursing homes, saying you can't require testing uh, for visitors to nursing homes. But I think Deirdre would back me up in saying it is a strong recommendation, especially in those red alert areas. If you care about the loved ones in the nursing homes, be strict about testing people before they go in and visit. As you know, uh, towns can revert to phase two. Um, uh, that sends a signal, I think, to some folks that uh, this is serious and you're in a red alert town. Um, of that list here, I think only Wyndham has actually taken advantage of that, but it is um, an option. And uh, uh, I can't say this enough, the three W's, wear the mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. Let me change gears for a second, and Melissa is going to help us out with this, but there's been some press about it, and I thought it was worth describing. Um, you know, we're learning all the time when it comes to COVID, and the only thing that changes as fast as COVID is the economics and the economic projections and what's going on in our region as regards the economy. And uh, right now, it's relative good news. Uh, thankfully, uh, Melissa McCall um, is very conservative in her projections, and um, we had thought, you know, going back a few months, we didn't know when this economy would start recovering. We didn't know when the stock market was going to be recovering. And uh, we uh, budgeted conservatively, and I really appreciate that. Today, where we have a little more history we can point to, it looks like um, our deficit won't be what we thought it could have been, a couple billion uh, dollars, and it's down to, um, you know, about a 40 percent reduction on that, 1.2 or so. And that makes a big difference in terms of what we're thinking about for this fiscal year, which ends uh, June 30. That, I think, is good news. Um, why are we doing better than a lot of our peers, and why are we doing better than what we had just projected, um, you know, a few months ago? What's going on there? Well, our revenue has improved by $454 million compared to what we had projected a few months ago. And that's because... Um, we're still down from where we were a year ago, but we're up from what we had projected. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one, we have um, more people paying taxes. We've had tens of thousands of people move into the state of Connecticut. We're one of the um, magnet states. We were, we we're a net loser going back a number of years where more people were leaving the state. Now they're coming in. They are paying sales tax. Some of them are beginning to pay a capital gains tax. Uh, a lot of that $295 million is paid for more by wealthy people because uh, who would have thought uh, back in April or May that the stock market would, would have doubled in the last six months, up 14 percent for the whole year. Uh, those folks are going to be contributing a little more to our state. Um, $160 million in sales and use tax, cigarette tax. Um, sales and use tax, again, we have more people paying it because our economy is coming back. And I think it was uh, thoughtful of the state to extend um, or reform our sales tax so it also includes Internet sales, not just uh, bricks and mortar sales. And that uh, really helped save us a fair amount of what could have been lost revenue in the sales tax side. Well, on the flip side, we've reduced our costs by over $300 million compared to uh, what we had uh, anticipated um, earlier on in our budget projections. A lot of that, over half of that, is related to health care, is related to Medicaid. Uh, some of that is due to uh, some improved federal reimbursement we're getting that is uh, tied to COVID. I don't know if that goes forever. It won't go forever. And uh, some of that is because of some reforms that we're making, lower, uh, lower levels of uh, service utilization. Some of that is people just nervous about going back into uh, the emergency room or seeing their... Um, so a lot of these... Um, uh, services that should that have been put off should take uh, place. We'll see whether there are any permanent reforms that bring down our health care costs, but that's generally good news. And finally, um, the mitigation plan, you see $125 billion in savings um, uh, compared to what was budgeted before. I think a lot of that is uh, Josh Jabal, uh, Chief of Staff, you know, working across all of our different departments, trying to find uh, efficiencies that could be long-lasting, not just short-term. We will see. I don't want to get um, uh, a 
ahead of myself here, but right now, compared to our peers in other states, uh, our budget is in relatively a better position, and this can change pretty fast. The Connecticut employment um, picture is worth taking a look at as well. Um, just to show you that, you know, during the depths of uh, COVID back last April, uh, you know, we were down 83 percent of employment. That was an enormous um, uh, unemployment hit to us. And you've seen that now we're back at uh, over 93 percent, if you can watch that chart going out to September 20th. And that has a lot of meaning. A, that's the best in the Northeast. Uh, our people have gone back to work more. Our downdraft down at 83 percent in April was a little less than our peers because we kept manufacturing open and outside construction, some things that you know about. Uh, but you'll uh, see, and we can tell from Europe, that uh, we'll see where that trend goes uh, going forward. But it, it's good news for us if we can keep it going, keeping our economy going, and we can only keep our economy going if we keep COVID in check. This next chart, um, and then I won't bore you with any more of these detailed charts, is um, just gives you a little comparison to this recession compared to uh, 1990 and 2001 and 2008. And um, the red line is our short history of the COVID uh, recession. It is not your uh, grandparents' traditional recession, uh, where you can see it goes down more gradually and up uh, over a period of uh, many months and years. In fact, you can see that 2008 recession, which is the green line, we only got back to 99 percent of full employment. Uh, you can see, again, red, that first, uh, you know, eight months that we've gone, a sharp downdraft. It's, um, you know, some people call it a V-shaped uh, a recovery, but it could, it's a lot sharper than that, the San Andreas Fault. But 93.3 percent is um, by no means um, something you can count on that trend going forward. I was on the phone with uh, Europe today regarding some businesses, and, um, you know, there they're moving into curfew. Um, infections are up by a factor of 10 compared to where they were before, and they're worried about further uh, turning back their economy, which they're desperate not to do. So take nothing for granted, but um, this gives you an idea at least how we're doing economically, how we're doing compared to other recessions, and uh, what our um, COVID response looks like on a statewide basis. So with that, uh, Josh and Paul, Deirdre, Melissa, and I are happy to take your questions. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Yes, Governor, I'd like to go back to hospitalizations if we could. Uh, what does the hospital capacity look like right now, and at what point do we need to be concerned about them filling back up? Well, I'll start with that, and then somebody smarter can help me out. But um, right now, as you remember, in the, in the bad old days, we had 2,000 COVID-related um, folks in our hospital rooms, and they were staying in there a longer period of time. Today, we're a little over 200, so we have a lot more capacity uh, than we did before, and people are spending a little less time in the hospital, a little less likely to go to the ICU, uh, which is, um, you know, the most uh, limited. Uh, we have some extra, you know, people in the hospitals today related to elective surgeries, a lot of which were being put off in the early days. And there's something the uh, hospitals have the ability to throttle a little bit based upon need going forward. But looking at hospital capacity is going to be very important to me over the next few months. Josh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and just in, in terms of the statistics, um, you know, statewide, uh, a quarter of hospital beds in total are unutilized right now. Um, and that's, as the governor said, without any actions being taken by the hospitals to free up beds from elective procedures or anything. Uh, and only about half of the ICU beds are occupied. So, you know, although the, the trends on hospitalizations have been increasing and we are watching that very carefully as a percentage of our total hospital capacity, the number of COVID hospitalizations we have is still very low. Um, one other thing I would add is uh, uh, you might recall that um, that the governor um, uh, developed these uh, COVID recovery facilities uh, during the first wave of the pandemic. And one of the key functions of that was to allow people to be discharged from the hospital who needed to go um, to have some additional care, um, but didn't need a hospital level of care. We have kept those facilities available 
And if needed, um, we can uh, call on that uh, capacity as well to help uh, people get discharged from the hospital sooner if they need to be. And Governor, going back to the uh, red alert towns, the concentration for the third week in a row seems to be southeastern Connecticut. Uh, what, if anything, should the casinos be doing to help combat the spread? And are you satisfied with their approach right now so far? I think I am. I mean, um, I, I don't think you see anything going from um, uh, the casinos to Norwich. Uh, I worry more about community spread, perhaps uh, infecting the casinos. My understanding, and Deirdre can help me out with this, is casinos are ramped up their testing significantly for employees and their families because uh, everybody wants to avoid a flare-up there as possible. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor Matt Austin Matt. with NBC Connecticut. I was wondering, it, you know, as you were saying before, it appears that only Wyndham has chosen to roll back to phase two at this point. If communities keep choosing um, not to fall back, would the alert system be re rethought or refigured? Would it potentially require communities to do that? Uh, not yet, and, and not at 15 per 100,000. But if we had a um, higher intensity of infections, if we saw more community spread, if we thought it was uh, impacting the region more, we'd have to take a second look at that. I don't think we're there yet. Okay. And also, just depending on how many cities and towns are added to that, that list, would there be a tipping point where the entire state would have to return to phase two? Uh, again, I think it would have to be a lot more intense than what you see. But I, as I you know, was talking about Europe, um, they're doing more and more on a regional basis over there. Uh, and if you think that Europe maybe is a month ahead of us, I hope that's not the case. Um, we're going to have to think as well. I mean, I spent a lot of time talking to Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey. We had taken a break from each other for a couple of months. But uh, now we're talking again and hoping to God that um, while we keep uh, transportation open between our respective areas, and I think we'll be able to announce something with Rhode Island and Massachusetts at some point um, soon, um, we're also thinking about what we have to do in terms of um, a response to COVID, if we have to do a unified response. Okay, thank you. News 8. Hey, Governor, this is Eva with News 8. I hope you're doing well. I had a quick question in regards to nursing homes. I know that a lot of people are looking to nursing homes now. We're seeing that some nursing homes are actually taking it upon themselves now to actually do visitor testing. Do you see the state stepping in at all to make this a requirement as we're watching these numbers tick up, especially with these vulnerable populations? Deirdre tells me the federal government won't let us do that. Deirdre? Yes. Um, so we, we would like to very strongly urge anyone visiting a, a nursing home to get tested. Some of the facilities are using antigen tests that were supplied by Health and Human Services, federal Health and Human Services, to offer testing, um, rapid testing on site. Um, we're distributing some of those Binax cards you heard the governor talk about last week or the week before. We're distributing some of those to nursing facilities. Uh, but if the facility where your loved one resides does not have that antigen testing available on site, we would strongly urge you to get tested before you visit your loved one. Um, and of course, the um, mask and hygiene and distancing is really critical. Nursing facilities are very susceptible and vulnerable, as we've learned uh, the hard way during this pandemic, to the infection being brought in. And it's very difficult to control once it's in the facility. So um, out of respect for our elderly residents and, and disabled residents in our nursing facilities, everyone who's visiting really should get tested and uh, be super, super vigilant on the, uh, the mask wearing and, and distancing. Fox 61. Yeah, good afternoon, Governor. Back to the red alert towns. And my question is this. Uh, for people who don't necessarily live in a red alert area, but go and work daily eight, nine, ten hours a day in a red alert area, should they think about following the recommendations that you've laid out? 
Well, the, I mean, the recommendations, yes, I would say. Um, remember, the recommendations are people over 65 stay close to home. Um, you can go back to phase two. So I'm trying to figure out exactly how it would impact somebody who works. But if you're saying, um, if you're in a red alert town, even if you're just working there, you should be as cautious as anybody that lives there, even more so, because you have the potential to bring that infection back to your home and your town. And then I asked you this question a couple of months ago, and I want to ask it again uh, uh, in light of the new numbers. Uh, how possible is it that um, you know we're about to see uh, we're about to see holiday gatherings, we're about to see uh, students returning from out of state colleges, we're going to have the election. There's the potential here for more spread and higher numbers here uh, later on in the fall. How likely is it that uh, our uh, robust program of testing and tracing will allow us to avoid a shutdown like we had last spring? We control what we can control, uh, just to be blunt about it. Um, our behavior has a, a real impact on what goes on, and I think you see that um, uh, over the last six months, as, as Connecticut is, is really led in terms of uh, wearing the mask and social distancing, the things that make a difference. But I can't promise you, look, uh, Boston has an infection rate that three times ours. Providence is pretty high. Um, New York is doing pretty well, except for some areas. Look, we found out the hard way that uh, this virus knows no borders. So we, we control as much of our destiny as we can. I'd like to think that we have learned so much more compared to six months ago. I think the therapies are better. I know the testing is better. I know we're doing, um, you know, five times more testing than we were before. It gives us a much better capability to uh, get this virus earlier, contain it better. Uh, is that 100 percent foolproof? No, but we're better positioned. All right. Thank you, Governor. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, Dr. Gifford. I was wondering if you might want to clear up any confusion on herd immunity. My uh, image of that was it had to do with vaccinations, not letting everybody in the world get sick. What's your? How do you explain that to people? Well, there are two ways that we can become immune to an infectious disease. One is by having it, you know, naturally occurring, catching the infection, recovering, and then having immunity. And the other is by an effective vaccination. Um, the, the concept of herd immunity just means that um, enough people in the population are immune one way or another, that your odds of catching it are, are very, very low because most of the people you bump into will be immune and won't uh, be sharing the infection. Herd immunity is, uh, is not typically the way that, uh, you know, an advanced society would manage a potentially preventable infectious disease that can cause hospitalizations and deaths. Um, you know, we, we try to prevent those hospitalizations and death um, and then we develop uh, and implement a vaccine, which is exactly uh, the process that the governor is leading. So um, in order to have enough people in our population immune uh, to, to COVID, we would either have to vaccinate them or see um, massive numbers of infection. So herd immunity in the absence of a vaccine is not really a viable option. How much, are, what percentage of the public would have to be immunized to get there and how long could that take potentially? You know, typically it depends on the effectiveness of the vaccination uh, of the vaccine. Typically the number you hear is around 80% to achieve herd immunity. The Associated Press. Uh, thank you, Max. I was um, wondering, first of all, if you live in a red alert district uh, town, how often should you get tested if you are if you have no symptoms? You want that one? Sure. Uh, well, so there's no hard and fast recommendation there. Certainly, if you have an exposure, uh, a known exposure, you should uh, wait a few days and then be tested. Um, wait at least three days, uh, around five is the best time to catch it. You should isolate yourself until you get yourself tested. 
Um, and, and then you also need to quarantine for the full 14 days if you have an exposure to a person who's known to have a COVID infection. So let, let me say that again, because this is such a critical part of our prevention strategy. If you have a known exposure to someone with a, a COVID infection, you need to stay home for 14 days, even if you have a negative test. So if you're living in one of these red alert communities, um, get a test if you have a known exposure. Get a test as often as once a week or once uh, every other week um, if you feel like you want to confirm um, that you don't have COVID and that you know, you're know you out and about, you have uh, the potential for exposure. There's not a real hard and fast recommendation on the frequency of asymptomatic testing, but it's available to you. It's free of charge, and we're encouraging people that live in these communities, um, especially if they think they are at high risk of exposure, to get tested. Uh, thank you for that. And maybe, Doctor, could you answer this? Do, you, do we know how many COVID cases originated in schools? Have there been any? And has there been any um, proof or tra contact tracing that's shown that they've linked any of these cases to people who've been hospitalized or who've passed away? So um, we have not seen uh, cases where we believe the transmission is happening in the schools with just a couple of exceptions. Um, we have seen obviously, and you've read about and, and we've talked about cases of people associated with schools that have gotten COVID and then schools have closed and they've done the contact tracing and reopened. Those are cases we believe um, are existing because there's COVID in the community. But we have not seen um, uh, cases where an entire classroom or an entire grade or an entire uh, club of a school has um, transmitted COVID from one to the next. So that's very good news, and we, we think that's because students and staff and faculty and administrators are doing um, a really strong job of implementing the masking and the distancing and the cohorting in the Connecticut schools. And we're very grateful for that, and we think that's what's allowing um, our, our schools to remain open and functioning and, and have kids get the benefit of in-person education. In terms of hospitalizations, you know, um, Many hospitals are doing COVID testing on admission, both for emergency and elective admissions. So they're trying to minimize the number of people who have an unknown infection. Testing isn't 100%. There are people who eventually become positive even with a negative test. Um, but we think the transmission from COVID infected patients to staff in hospitals is very, very low. Well, I'm sorry, I meant though you haven't had any cases where um, there's been someone that's been hospitalized because they've been infected by, say, a kid that went to school. Nothing like that has happened. Not that we're aware of, no. And uh, Governor, I just um, wanted to ask you too, have, uh, do you have a reaction to the, um, the Purdue, Purdue Pharma, uh, uh, their, um, their settlement with the Department of Justice, seeing as how they're a Connecticut company? They are a Connecticut company, and um, you know OxyContin, uh, badly abused, is is killed um, you know millions in our in our country, and uh, I'll let the lawyers you know fuss about the nature of the penalty and is it enough, uh, but I do think it uh, Sue speaks to sort of a failure of our healthcare system. It's not you know Purdue Pharma you know. Um, had OxyContin for people with severe pain, then it was abused, widely distributed, overused. Um, I don't know what happened to the distribution folks. Nobody stood up. Um, the doctors were prescribing it. Nobody stood up. The hospitals knew about this. Nobody stood up. The insurance companies were paying for it. Everybody just sort of passed it along. So um, I don't want to be tough, Deirdre, but I do think it's a bit of an indictment of our, our health system. Uh, I don't know where the checks and balances were there. I'm glad they're going to pay a penalty, Sue, in terms of uh, this particular incident. But I think we have to look at this health care system and see what we can do to make sure this never happens again. Thank you very much. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks, Max. Hi, Governor. Welcome um, back. <laughs> it seems like I've been staying at the same desk for uh, seven months in a row. Um, 
Can I ask Josh or Dr. Gifford to get a little more granular for me on the um, why Norwalk and Fairfield are on the list this week? Um, I know we were talking about small gatherings in Danbury and, and Norwich, and uh, we have the universities in Fairfield, but uh, Norwalk uh, is a bit of a surprise to me. Josh? Yeah. DJ, you want to take one? Sure. So, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Josh. I was just pulling up the numbers. You go ahead. Sure. Um, so for Fairfield, um, the the analysis from the epidemiology team and, and local health is that the cases there seem to be quite concentrated in the two universities there, uh, Fairfield University and, and Sacred Heart. Uh, fortunately, in both cases, uh, week to week, the number of cases has come down, and indeed in the town of Fairfield, the number of cases has come down, and the test positivity rate has gone down. Uh, week to week. So hopefully that's trending in a more favorable direction, even though um, on a two week average, um, they are red. Um, Nor Norwalk is, is definitely more concerning. Norwalk uh, case growth has been, uh, it was very strong um, from week to week, 72 cases uh, two weeks ago, 163 cases last week. Um, with, with test positivity about 5% in Norwalk. So um, I know our team is working closely with the local health department there and the local officials. Uh, it sounds like it's a lot of the same type of activity we've been hearing about and seeing in Eastern Connecticut, other parts of the state, other parts of the country, small gatherings, um, people letting their guard down, not wearing their masks, um, a, a no, no individual event or events to point to specifically, but just general community spread. So really important that everyone in, in Norwalk and, and around the area take extra precautions and, and get tested as, uh, as Commissioner Gifford was talking about. Um, thanks. And Commissioner, uh, um, the, the new CDC guidelines, uh, it seems like uh, it's it's portrayed as a bigger deal than what it is. I mean, it's still a 15 minute exposure. It's just over a longer period. Is that the way I should understand it? Yes, yeah, so the new CDC guidelines, um, uh, they used to talk, the old guidelines talked about an exposure being defined as 15 consecutive minutes within six feet of someone who is known to have COVID. The new, the change that was updated this week says 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. So multiple shorter exposures within a day to an individual with COVID could be um, classified uh, as, a, as an exposure. Oh, thanks for explaining that uh, in a way that I can understand. Um, hey governor, so can you, you just drop this, I was talking to people in Europe on, about business today. What were you talking about? Who were you talking to? Just stuff. <laughs> Is that a no comment? Snow. You're talking about snow? Jeez. Let it go, Ken. Um, we'll keep going. <laughs> We're not, I'm not going to play 20 questions. Uh, the other reporters behind me are, uh, I'm sure, angry already. Hey, Josh, so... Um, uh, maybe uh, uh, Melissa, um, are we seeing attrition savings uh, yet on the people who are um, going to be retiring, or is that still another year and a half off? Sure. So um, we haven't begun to see a significant uptick in retirements. I do think um, we are uh, we're continuing to see the normal rate of retirement-related attrition um, as we get closer to June of 2021. Uh, we expect to see that ramp up. Certainly, I think COVID has played, could potentially have played into some of the more recent decisions. Um, as the governor indicated, you know, the work has begun to begin um, thinking about continuity of those areas where we have some risk and using that as an opportunity to strengthen operations throughout the state agency. So nothing spiking at this moment in time, but we're obviously preparing for uh, next June. Thanks, folks. The Connecticut Mirror. Good afternoon. Uh, um, I'll share with you another time the look on Paul Mound's face, Governor, when you tried to not answer Ken's question. She <laughs> <laughs> um, said earlier uh, that half the ICU beds are occupied. Um, do you have a sense for how many of those are occupied by COVID patients?
Who wants that, Deirdre? Yes. Josh? Uh, answer is uh, 39 COVID positive patients in the ICU out of 232 total COVID patients in, in patients right now. Okay, and excuse me, I, I think most of us on the call don't know off the top of our heads how many ICU beds there are. D can you give some context for the... Uh... Yes, I'm, I'm surprised you don't know that number, Paz, yeah. off the top of your head, but um, <laughs> there, are, there are just over a thousand ICU beds uh, in the state, adult ICU beds in the state, and as mentioned, 39 of them are currently occupied by COVID positive patients. And you said, uh, let me see, there's an availability of a quarter of all hospital beds. So my question is, for this time of year, what is uh, quote unquote normal for availability of ICU and uh, general beds in a hospital? No? Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll take, I'll take a stab at that. I. I I think um, as a general rule, that occupancy level is probably on the low end. Um, uh, hospitals, as, as the governor alluded to, um, healthcare utilization is still somewhat down, although it's rebounded back from where we were during the pandemic. So I think there are fewer elective procedures still being done, fewer elective admissions. Um, so I think that number is probably a little bit lower. Um, and it's certainly low for flu season. Uh, which we're not in yet, but um, it's probably a little bit low uh, year over year. All right, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make those questions sound like we were playing college ball, uh, but I guess what I was getting at is overall capacity for, for hospitals. And so if those are elective, is, I guess is the feeling that you can dial back occupancy in the hospitals if need be, all right? Okay, and then the last question, uh, what's the seven day rolling average uh, at this point? I don't think you mentioned that. Uh, test positivity, uh, the seven day rolling average is 2.1%. Okay, all right folks, thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I have a kind of a similar question uh, to Ken about his phrase about getting granular. Um, Waterbury was near the 15 per 100,000 mark last week. I did not look up, and I cannot look up right now, the numbers for prospect, but uh, that sort of left out. So uh, what is the, uh, the explanation, um, or if there is one, uh, for uh, the uptick uh, in prospect as well as Waterbury? Yeah, I, I think, Paul, uh, I'll start, and Deidre, please uh, add, but I think, Paul, when we're talking to the, the, te the epidemiology team, you can see not just um, Waterbury and and, uh, and Prospect, but some of the surrounding towns that are in the orange as well, that there is some community spread going on in the in the uh, Noctuck Valley uh, up through that area. So, um, again, same same explanations, Eastern Connecticut, we talked about Norwalk earlier, no, no major events or super spreaders to point to, a lot of uh, community transmission that we're concerned about um, that has spiked up a little bit in that area. Commissioner Gifford? Yeah, the, the only thing I will add is that um, I think because there have been a number of these high profile super spreader events, um, it, it's understandable that everyone um, has anticipates that maybe there that we can point to one of these when we start to see um, uh, increases in cases, and um, and maybe in some sense it's reassuring to to for people to know. Oh, I haven't been to one of those events, and so therefore I'm safer. But um, the the thing about this virus is that once it's in the community, just like I mentioned, once it's in a nursing facility, it's extremely contagious if people aren't vigilant with their masks and their distancing. So just a couple of cases, no matter how they're introduced into the community, um, if they, they start to spread from one to another to another, if people who are sick don't stay home and if people who are exposed don't stay home, um, it just spreads uh, uh, very rapidly from person to person to person. 
So um, a super spreader event is not necessary in order to see widespread community transmission uh, because it, it, it can spread efficiently. Uh, unfortunately, about this virus, it can spread very efficiently in a community, even without one of those super spreader events. Uh, thank you. Um, did the mayors of Prospect and Waterbury uh, indicate that they have made a decision not to roll back uh, the uh, third phase opening rules? Uh, did they make any kind of uh, indication of what, they're, what they plan to do now that they're in this category? Uh, I, I can take that. Um, the, the, as the governor mentioned from last week's list, only uh, Wyndham indicated that they would roll back. The, the new additions to the list um, they have 96 hours to notify DECD about their decision. Yeah, okay. I just I was just wondering if they might have said something today. Uh, okay, thanks for that. Uh, and in terms of uh, the hospitalizations, can you give us more on the, on the demographics of the patients that we're seeing, the, the, the ages, uh, races, any, 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 anything you can, you can give us to give us an idea of who is actually being hospitalized? Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, uh, Paul, from discussions we've had with uh, leaders of, the, of some of the major hospitals, um, it's, it's a very similar demographic to what we've seen throughout the pandemic. Um, tends to be uh, older, although it's slightly, just slightly seems to be uh, trending a little bit younger than, the, than in the, the spring. Um, but in terms of most of the dimensions that we, we do uh, you know, track this stuff, it's, it seems to be pretty consistent demographically. Okay, and just uh, one more question. In terms of the, the nursing home staff testing, is, is, is basically all staff at all homes get tested again? Um, if so, when did that start? Um, so we never stopped testing staff in nursing facilities. Um, when we began testing staff back in the late spring, um, it, was, it was a question of whether we were doing it weekly or monthly. Um, last, over the last few weeks when we've issued alerts, um, in towns and in the entire county of New London, we've gone back to asking all facilities to test all staff weekly, test all residents weekly if there's any case at all among staff. Um, and we're talking about how to enhance that even further across the rest of the state. Okay, just, just to clarify, ask or require if there's a staff member who tests? Uh, they're required to test residents if there's a staff member who tests positive. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Sure. The Hartford Current. Hey, everyone. This is Emily Brindley from The Current. Um, Governor, I'd like to ask a question for you first. Um, you mentioned earlier this week, I think it was on Tuesday, our 3% positivity day. You mentioned that Connecticut is not an island, which kind of explains why we might be, have, might be seeing this spike that we've been seeing right now. But then with the red alert towns, you're pushing for different restrictions on an even smaller basis than the state as a whole. So if the entire state isn't an island, can you explain the logic behind treating individual towns as islands? Yeah, Emily. Um... It does seem to me that um, in Danbury and other places, uh, we've been able to bring in um, the rapid response team and on a municipality basis really make a big difference in terms of containing the virus. So I don't have to treat this on a statewide basis necessarily if I can target our resources where it's needed. But uh, you're right uh, when I said about an island. If we found that we were in a, a very different situation, much like you're seeing in a, you know, Europe right now, I'd be talking to my regional governors, seeing what we should do on a broader basis, not just the state of Connecticut. But right now, I think we're talking about these flare-ups, and um, hopefully we're going to be able to keep them contained. Okay, fair enough. And um, I also want to ask about, you know, we've been seeing these numbers trending up. For, it's about six times. And every time where those metrics kind of jump up again, um, you and your administration point to the spike and say that it's not something to be super worried about yet. So can you... Sorry, Emily, we can't hear you clearly. Yeah, Emily, your, uh, your audio is... This is the time about where we are now. Emily, your, uh, your audio is, it, is cutting out. Um, is it any, any better now? 
Uh, it, it sounds all right now if you want to give it a try. Okay. Um, I was just asking, the positivity rate jumped above 1% for the first time back on September 9th. So it's been about six weeks of uptick in numbers there. And every time one of the metrics ticks up, you and your administration say that the spike isn't quite big enough to be really concerned about yet. So can you tell me when, at what point would you actually feel worried about this? And after six weeks of rising numbers, how concerned are you now? I'm concerned, Emily. Uh, don't let me dismiss this. Um, you're right. Six weeks ago, we were 1 percent, and uh, today we're um, in a seven-day average is over 2 percent. We've had a day at 3 percent, and uh, I look what's going on around the country. I see states that have 20, 30, 40 percent positivity. I see my neighbors. I've got we've got great neighbors here in Connecticut. We've been um, really able to. Um, you know, keep a very low positivity rate for a long time. We've been, um, you know, the rest of the country has looked with envy. And, uh, but we can't do that forever, and we're seeing this uh, spiking up right now. So um, I take nothing for granted. Uh, if uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what was your question in terms of how those changes impact us. I think you answered it. I really just was asking how concerned you are right now. Um, and if I could ask Dr. Gifford the same question, just about, you know, how much worry do you have now and, and how much worry do you have for the next few weeks or few months? Uh, I heard the governor say once that he was paid to worry, so I, I put myself in that uh, category. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of my job to be um, uh, thinking about the future. Um, the reason that we um, uh, wanted to put out this alert map was because we want people in Connecticut to know what's going on in, in their town and their county and, and to take action. Um, the, a lot of this prevention uh, of turning this around is within our own personal control. It has to do with our behaviors um, uh, with one another at the workplace in, in, uh, when we're uh, you know, engaging in commerce. All of those things are going to help us um, prevent the spike that we saw in March and April, which is our uh, very much our goal, to minimize infections, and by minimizing infections, to minimize hospitalizations and deaths. And so um, the reason for, for us sharing these alerts and letting towns know, even if they're in the yellow zone, 5 to 10, that means you're higher than where we were just, uh, just a, a month or two ago, as you point out. So now's the time to take action. Don't do what you can to help us prevent your town from going to, from yellow to orange. And if you've gone to orange, do what you can to get back in the yellow. And, and if you're in the red, let's all work together to do what you can to get your town back into the orange or, or the yellow or, or hopefully off the alert list altogether. So, um, you know, we, we don't, panic is not helpful in, in this kind of a situation, but action and, and well-informed strategic action is helpful. So I think we should all be concerned and then take the appropriate actions. All right, thank you all, I appreciate it. CT News Junkie. Uh, thanks, Max. Hi, everyone. It, it sounds like from a uh, statewide standpoint, we have the hospital bed capacity situation sort of at, at least under control. I was wondering in these flare up areas though, are there any capacity uh, situations in, in like the Southeast area hospitals where, um, where we're having a lot more um, cases? No, actually, um you know, somewhat to the contrary, you know, as mentioned, as governor mentioned at the beginning, um, fortunately, you know, we've seen in the last week uh, the cases in, in New London and in, in, uh, in Norwich actually ticked down just slightly. So that's encouraging. And, and equally, the hospitalizations in New London County um, are also down slightly off their peaks, um, not dramatically, but at least not not continuing to grow. So that's that's encouraging uh, news. And one of the other important lessons that we learned back in the spring um, was that our hospitals uh, work together very well, um, both the big networks, but even outside of their own networks, working with the other independent hospitals, um, they worked very well when we needed to, to transfer patients, to move resources and staff around, to load balance, essentially, when they needed. So it's, it's actually 
Um, we are a small enough state where we can uh, have that flexibility that means that even if one particular county was experiencing a surge in their hospitals, we could um, you know, leverage the capacity we have in other counties as well. Okay, thanks. Um, Governor, I was wondering, have you, uh, have you voted absentee this year? Are you, are you planning on voting in person? What, what are your voting uh, plans for this election cycle? Yeah, I was, um, I was going to vote in person. I, I've thought about that since I'm 66, but I just uh, think um, voting is such an important citizen's obligation and right that um, I want to be able to go vote in person if I can do anything to encourage people to vote. Uh, I want you to vote, um, if you can, by absentee ballot. If you can, if you can't, um, you know, drop it off at the ballot box or go there and vote and socially distance. But that's a message I wanted to send, so I'll be voting on Election Day in person. Okay. Uh, any plans to watch the uh, the debate tonight? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it's um, it's pretty good theater, and uh, you know, I thought the first debate was very revealing about uh, two different uh, men in their uh, style and the way they uh, approach issues. So I'll be looking to see if there's anything um, new to add. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. I got to say. Um, Deirdre and Josh, you did a lot of overtime work today. Um, and um, Melissa and Paul, thank you. Obviously, there was a lot more um, concern about our physical health than economic health, but we were uh, prepared to answer uh, both questions. Like, a lot of the tone of the questions is, is a bit of here we go again. And I, um, I heard an a amalgam word the other day. It was a combination of quarantine and eternity, quarantinity, something like that. Here we go again. And um, I know we're now moving into the holiday season. We've got uh, Halloween in about uh, 10 days and uh, Thanksgiving thereafter. Um, they, they had a chart they wanted me to read. I wanted you to see this um, of all the creative ways that people can enjoy Halloween. Uh, this is just one example of you put your candy into the chute and it doesn't require it. Um, on a personal basis, uh, I love Halloween and uh, I love it uh, as an old guy and I love being there with those kids. And uh, so this year, for the first year, we're not going to be able to do Halloween at the governor's residence. Um, we are in uh, Hartford, and it is in a red zone. We do attract a crowd, and uh, I say that with great disappointment. Um, but that said, um, I want you all to be able to enjoy these holidays and do it safely. I know you've got to get that right balance. Um, I've always had Thanksgiving, big extended family. The kids would bring a, a friend from all over. And I just had to tell them, this is not the year to do that. Um, this is a year, I know you're kind of sick of the old man and mom and just the five of us being together, but uh, we're going to have to do that uh, for this cycle. And, uh, but I say that um, to each and every one of you as we stay close, stay close to home, stay with your closest friends. Just for this next six, eight weeks, i got to believe that we're going to be turning a page at some point here. And the more you can um, maintain that dis discipline, that quarantine eternity a little bit longer, will make a big difference for all of us going forward in a bright new year. Thank you, everybody.